Section 35 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. D. Milk Producer Meetings on March 16 with Kalmbach and Connolly. In March 1972, the AMPI officials came to Washington and met with Kalmbach and then Secretary Connolly. By then, the milk producers were expressing their deep concern over the antitrust suit, and in light of the emerging ITT scandal, the Republicans apparently were developing a new strategy to avoid further embarrassment from milk producer contributions by postponing them until just prior to the election. 1. Meeting with Kalmbach By mid-March, Marin was, quote, beginning to get nervous, end quote, about a commitment because of the, quote, remarkable temporal association of contributions, end quote, and the price support effort in 1971. As noted above, Isham understood from Marin that tape would contribute, and this is corroborated by Nelson, who says that Marin, in fact, had decided after February 3, but before the next meeting with Kalmbach, to contribute more money to the president's campaign. But by that time, damaging information had been publicized, linking the settlement of a government antitrust suit against ITT and a large contribution by ITT through its subsidiaries for the Republican National Convention, following high-level meetings between Mitchell and ITT officials. Kalmbach says that he anticipated an effort by AMPI to seek a quid pro quo on the antitrust suit, and that he decided to tell the AMPI officials that he would not solicit any more contributions from them, and that any pledge for contributions would be abrogated. On March 16, Marin, Nelson, and Jacobson met with Kalmbach in his room in the Madison Hotel. Footnote. The committee has fixed the date of the meeting based upon evidence it has uncovered in its investigation. Marin and Jacobson testified that they were not sure of the date of the meeting, although they thought it probably occurred sometime in March or April. Although Marin said he thought the meeting occurred on April 23 or 24, Kalmbach was not in Washington in April after the 7th. Nelson testified that the meeting took place on the same day they met with Secretary Connolly, which, according to Connolly's logs, was March 16. Kalmbach testified that he, too, thought the meeting occurred in mid-March. The committee staff has reviewed the logs and hotel charges of those present at the meeting and found that the only time in March or April 1972 when all four were at the Madison Hotel in Washington was on March 15 and 16. Moreover, Jacobson added that Kalmbach was about to leave for New York at the time of the meeting, and Kalmbach's logs indicated that he left Washington and went to New York on March 16. Therefore, it appears that the meeting took place on the day of the 16th. End footnote. The meeting was brief. Kalmbach told them of his decision, and Merrin replied that it should be clearly understood that he, Merrin, was not breaching any commitments. It is not clear whether, as a result of the meeting, all further solicitations for the President's campaign were terminated or just whether Kalmbach personally was withdrawing and that solicitations were being suspended only for a time. Although Merrin says that it was his understanding that no further solicitations would be made by anyone connected with the campaign effort, Kalmbach's message was, according to Merrin's own recollection, more limited. Kalmbach told him that, quote, I will not proceed any further with discussions or negotiations on political contributions, end quote, and that he, quote, personally would make no more representation to AMPI, end quote. Nelson says that Kalmbach told them he was not going to seek additional contributions, quote, presently, and that Nelson understood that there would be further solicitations after April 7. Subsequent events have corroborated Nelson's understanding. 
it appears that the efforts to obtain further milk producers support for the president were not terminated on march sixteen but only postponed until just prior to the election in fact after meeting with kalmbach on the sixteenth the milk producers met with secretary connolly who in a similar fashion advised them only to postpone their contributions two meeting with connolly the milk producers had secured the assistance of treasury secretary connolly in march nineteen seventy one in their successful effort to obtain a price support increase a year later in march nineteen seventy two they again turned to him for help in the antitrust suit and several other matters it is virtually undisputed that they met with connolly on march sixteen and discussed their antitrust irs and other problems that Connolly called Mitchell about the impact of these problems on the president's campaign, and that there was a reference at the meeting to postponing contributions until later in the year. Lilly testified that upon Marin's return to San Antonio, Marin told him that it was also understood that the antitrust suit and a pending IRS investigation of MPI would be slowed and ultimately terminated on favorable terms for AMPI. Before turning to the March 16, 1972 meeting itself, a discussion of the background of the IRS investigation and related matters, including a possible criminal prosecution against AMPI by the Justice Department for a corporate political contribution, is set forth below. A irs and justice department investigations in the course of a routine audit by irs of the income tax return of ampi's predecessor mpi for the nineteen sixty eight fiscal year irs agents uncovered payments in nineteen sixty eight by mpi and several of its constituent co-ops totaling over ninety thousand dollars from corporate funds to a Washington, D.C. printing firm, ostensibly for the costs of printing a compilation of President Johnson's messages to the 90th Congress titled, quote, No Retreat from Tomorrow, end quote. Footnote. In addition to the amounts paid to the printing firm, approximately $14,000 more was also paid by AMPI to two other firms for expenses relating to publication of the book. End footnote. Upon further investigation, it was found that earlier in 1968, the printer had billed and received payment from the Salute to the President Committee, an adjunct of the DNC, and that the subsequent three co-op checks to that firm for the $90,000 solicited by an official of the DNC constituted a duplicate payment and were therefore endorsed by the printer to the salute to the president committee the co-op reflected these payments on its corporate books partly as an quote, advertising expense and partly as quote, office supplies expense footnote in fact the book quote, no retreat from tomorrow end quote, bears no indication that it was paid for or sponsored by ampi and thus appears to have been of no advertising or public relations benefit to the co-op the san antonio irs agent in charge of the audit doyle bond notified ampi in mid nineteen seventy one that this transaction was being investigated bob lilly immediately informed jake jacobson by letter dated august twenty sixth nineteen seventy one of the matter and concluded, quote, this should, and did, raise eyebrows, end quote. Jacobson says that in 1972, after discussing the tax matter with either Merrin or Nelson, he suggested that AMPI retain Marvin Colley, whom he considered, quote, the best tax lawyer in Texas, end quote, and who was a partner of Vinson, Elkins, Searles, Connolly, and Smith, Treasury Secretary Connolly's former law firm. Connolly and Jacobson each testified that before AMPI hired Colley, Jacobson asked Connolly whether he would have any objection. Connolly told Jacobson he did not. Connolly and Jacobson testified 
that their discussion took place sometime in 1972, possibly at the close of the March 16 meeting with Marin. However, since AMPI records indicate that Collie was retained by AMPI in January or early February 1972, and the jacobson Connolly discussion took place preliminary to AMPI hiring Collie, the conversation must have taken place prior to that meeting. At about the same time that Collie was being retained, IRS Commissioner Johnny Walters was contacted concerning the matter, and personally inquired about it from the IRS Regional Commissioner from the Southwest Region, with jurisdiction over the MPI audit, Albert Brisbin. During January 17 to 19, 1972, Brisbane and Walters attended a meeting for regional commissioners in Washington. At that time, according to Brisbane, Commissioner Walters handed him a three-paragraph document, apparently prepared by a co-op representative, stating the facts with respect to the tax matter under investigation, and he asked Brisbane to give him a report. Brisbane says he understood that the document had been given to Walters by some high official at the Treasury Department, presumably Connolly or one of his assistant secretaries. Upon returning to Dallas, Brisbane passed the matter and the document on to the then IRS District Director for Austin, Robert Finney, who in turn sent it to his subordinate with the handwritten comment, quote, Al Brisbane quoted Commissioner Walters to me, saying, Do what's right, but let's close it as soon as we can. End quote. Brisbane recalls Walters giving him those instructions at the time he gave him the document in Washington, and he and Finney agree that Brisbane called Finney personally to pass on Walters' comment. Finney considered this a very unusual aspect of the case, and said that he did not recall any similar request from Walters. When asked about the incident, Walters said he had no recollection of handling the document, and he is fairly certain that he did not receive it from Connolly or any top Treasury official. Although he knows Collie, Walters is sure Collie did not speak to him about the case. Walters has some recollection of having heard the title of the book and of telling an IRS official to complete the audit and not let the matter drag on. As a result of Walters' inquiry, a meeting was held in Brisbane's office on February 1, 1972, at which Agent Bond briefed the regional officials, including Brisbane. By that time, Bond had recommended that the matter be referred to the Criminal Division of the Justice Department as a possible violation of Title 18, Section 610, Corporate Political Contributions. At the meeting, three decisions were made. The taxpayer, AMPI, was to be given an additional opportunity to justify the expenditures to IRS before IRS disallowed them. The matter would be referred to the Criminal Division for possible criminal prosecution, and a sensitive case report would be prepared for the commissioner. The report was prepared and hand-delivered by Brisbane to Walters a week later, when Walters was in Texas on unrelated matters, and on February 15, the report was forwarded to Washington. Walters had no recollection of the briefing or the report. With respect to the referral for criminal prosecution, Brisbane said that his district director, Finney, still objected to the referral after the February 1 meeting. Normally, the district director would sign the referral and the regional commissioner would not review it. However, because of Finney's objections, Brisbane says that in an unusual move, he overruled Finney and took the matter from him and on February 22, 1972, personally signed the memorandum for referral of the matter to the Justice Department. Footnote. Brisbane's memo was forwarded to the Intelligence Division of IRS, according to regular IRS procedure, and then forwarded to Henry Peterson, Assistant Attorney General, on February 29, 1972. End footnote. 
even more unusual was the reason brisbane says finney gave for his objection according to brisbane finney didn't object on substantive grounds rather finney expressed concern to brisbane that if the matter were referred to the justice department quote, it will be written up in jack anderson end quote. finney who was interviewed before brisbane made no mention in a staff interview of any objection on his part to the referral brisbane says he understood finney to be concerned about possible embarrassment to the former president and those close to him including connolly finney had known president johnson and connolly for over twenty-five years and had joined with connolly and several others in nineteen forty six in investing in a local radio station in texas finney says that he had no contact with connolly concerning the audit but acknowledged that collie whom finney also knew did speak to him once about the matter according to finney collie told him that he had been retained by ampi and he was advising his client not to oppose the irs disallowance of the expense deduction for the book finney says that he told collie of the referral to the justice department although finney recalls collie meeting with him in finney's office collie's billings to ampi show only one contact with finney a long-distance telephone call on march eighth nineteen seventy two collie had been interviewed by the staff prior to the finney interview when questioned about his conversation with finney he testified question what did mr finney tell you what was the total of his conversation answer i told mr finney that i had advised ampi to give up entirely on the assertions by the internal revenue service and that i hoped that that would close the case i further said that it involved the case involved people of wide public fame and that i certainly hoped that there wouldn't be leaks and he would take appropriate action to make sure that the normal secrecy of the internal revenue service was asserted question what did mr finney have to say answer he thanked me for the information he said he assumed that the usual secrecy would be preserved but he was familiar with the case and and that well that was about all collie made no reference to the matter of the referral to the justice department finney says was discussed during the following week march thirteenth to seventeen the revenue agent bond met with ampi representatives who informed him that ampi would not contest disqualification of the expense deduction in question on march fifteenth nineteen seventy two bond recommended to his superior that he be permitted to audit the returns for the subsequent two years the final two returns filed by mpi for the periods ending june thirty nineteen sixty nine and september thirty nineteen sixty nine and the first ampi return for the period ending june thirty nineteen seventy in his recommendation bond stated that quote, at least one more examination should be conducted before we can really evaluate the audit potential of the organization end quote. in contrast to the time spent on the nineteen sixty eight audit according to irs records approximately seventeen hundred hours he noted that quote, future examinations can be conducted in considerably less time end quote within the next few days ampi notified irs that it would not contest the irs disallowance of the expense deductions for the book and the 1968 audit was closed at that point after the referral to the justice department and bond's recommendation for additional tax audits Marin, nelson and jacobson met with connolly b the meeting jacobson says that he wanted to introduce Marin to connolly whom he considered to be influential in the administration Marin says jacobson told him quote, mr connolly has become a very important man in this administration he is going to be an important man in the future End quote. jacobson thought the first meeting would be purely introductory and that he did not expect Marin to take up with connolly any problems until a later time instead 
Marin took the opportunity, quote, as a forum for discussing all the problems that AMPI had been having with this administration, end quote, including, quote, the antitrust suit and dairy imports and price supports, end quote. Marin says he told Connolly that the antitrust litigation was costing AMPI a great deal of money and that, together with actions in other areas, evidenced, quote, a pattern of adverse reaction on the part of the administration, end quote. Both Marin and Jacobson conceded that the antitrust matter was discussed, with the hope that Connolly would perhaps talk to others to help them in the ongoing settlement negotiations, and Jacobson says that Connolly was, quote, sympathetic, end quote. Connolly says the antitrust suit and other problems were reviewed as, quote, an informative type of thing, end quote, and he does not recall that they asked him to do anything for them. Connolly responded to AMPI's request immediately and apparently at a purely political level. Connolly says that he called Mitchell that day or the next day to relay to him the information that the antitrust suit was going to have a, quote, very damaging effect politically upon the Republican Party, end quote. Footnote. Connolly's logs indicate a call to Mitchell on the day of the meeting, March 16, but no record was kept of the time of his telephone calls except for those to and from the president. End footnote. By Merrin's account, Connolly telephoned Mitchell during the meeting in the presence of Merrin, Nelson, and Jacobson, despite the fact that Connolly considered this, quote, unusual. Merrin says Connolly told Mitchell that, I have a group of people here who seem to be somewhat incensed with what they seem to consider systematic punitive action of this administration. This can do us damage in the Middle West. You get some people out there and find out what is going on, because we're going to have political trouble if we don't. Footnote. Mitchell said that he could not remember any call from Connolly about the milk producer's antitrust suit. End footnote. Marin says Connolly also called Senator Dole, then chairman of the Republican National Committee, and gave him essentially the same information. It appears that, in addition to these references to the political aspects of the antitrust suit, there was a reference to political contributions in the meeting, according to Marin, at Connolly's initiation. Marin testified that at the end of the meeting, Connolly remarked that political contributions, quote, would be more useful toward the end of the campaign than now. They'll need it worse at the end of the campaign than they do now, end quote. When Connolly was asked in an executive session before the select committee on November 15, 1973, whether there was any discussion of the timing of political contributions by the milk producers, Connolly testified that he did not recall any discussion of contributions. After Marin testified that there was, the committee asked Connolly to submit an affidavit to the committee, responding to several questions, including the following. Question. In your meeting with Harold Nelson, Jake Jacobson, and George Marin on March 16, 1972, was the subject of campaign contributions from the dairy people to the president's re-election effort, including the amount, form, and timing of such contributions discussed? Connolly submitted an affidavit to the committee dated April 11, 1974, in which, contrary to his earlier testimony, he states that he now does recall a reference to contributions at the meeting, although he says Marin, not he, initiated the discussion. During Dr. Marin's discourse on AMPI's problems, including internal revenue problems and the antitrust suit which had been filed, as I recall, he made some general comment to the effect that under all the circumstances, AMPI probably should discontinue all political contributions until later. I responded by saying something to the effect that this sounded reasonable. I do not recall any specific discussion of campaign contributions to the president's re-election effort in this meeting, nor a discussion of the amount, form, and timing of any such contributions, except as the general discussion mentioned above can be considered 
to encompass these subjects. Connolly's advice was consistent with Kalmbach's message to the milk producers that day that Kalmbach was not then accepting further dairy contributions. As Connolly indicates in his affidavit submitted to the committee, the tax matter was discussed at the meeting. Jacobson expressed his opinion that, although there may have been some reference to the IRS matter at the March 16 meeting, and according to Connolly there was, he thought it would have been, quote, improper to talk to Connolly about the pending case. In a conversation with Marion after the March 16 meeting discussed below, Lilly recalls, based on his notes of the conversation, that Marin told him that Connolly had called Mitchell during the meeting and that there had been a discussion of a, quote, promise to go slow on IRS, end quote. At the close of the meeting, Jacobson remained behind and conferred privately with Connolly for approximately five minutes to discuss, in Jacobson's words, quote, Texas politics, end quote. Although Jacobson and Connolly say that may have been the occasion on which they discussed Collie representing AMPI on the IRS matter, it now appears, as discussed above, that their discussion took place at some earlier time. C. Lilly's Account Several weeks after the meeting, Marin relayed to Bob Lilly the substance of the meeting with Connolly. Lilly has contemporaneous notes which he made of his conversation with Merrin, which indicate that it was understood that, as a result of the meeting, the antitrust and IRS matters were going to be resolved in AMPI's favor, and milk producer contributions were to be delayed until later in the year. It is striking how much of Lilly's hearsay account given to the Select Committee in November 1973, the first time the Select Committee learned of the March 16 meeting, has been corroborated by evidence subsequently obtained by the Committee. According to Lilly, Marin, Nelson, and Jacobson met with Connolly in his office in March 1972, and that in their presence Connolly called Mitchell and discussed 1. Delaying contributions to the Republican Party by AMPI's political trust. 2. Slowing down the antitrust suit against AMPI and at a later time reducing it to a wrist slap. And 3. Promising to go slow on the IRS audit of AMPI. Lilly says that Connolly then called Senator Dole, who, like Mitchell, agreed to defer any obligations due the Republican Party meaning contributions that might be due, but to delay them until near the general election time. Lilly says he understood that the AMPI representatives had met with Kalmbach, too, in March. Since the time of Lilly's testimony, the participants in the meeting have acknowledged that the antitrust and IRS matters were discussed that Connolly called Mitchell and Dole and discussed the political implications of these problems, and that Connolly at least concurred in a delay in further contributions. Nonetheless, standing alone, Lilly's hearsay account, based upon a report provided by Merrin of the understandings allegedly reached on the IRS and antitrust matters, not supported by the participants, might have to be discounted. However, at least that aspect of Lilly's account in connection with the antitrust suit is supported by events several weeks after the meeting. According to Kalmbach and others, on April 4, Marin, whether from a misunderstanding of the discussions on March 16 or from an eagerness to demonstrate to the administration his good faith intention to support the president's re-election effort, contacted Kalmbach and made an attempt to make a substantial pre-April 7 contribution in exchange for assistance in terminating the Justice Department antitrust suit against AMPI, as discussed below. 3. Disposition of the Tax Investigations The investigation by the committee has uncovered no evidence of any improper action taken by governmental officials after the March 16 meeting in Connolly's office, either with respect to the IRS audit or the case referred to the Justice Department. However, 
for several reasons apparently unrelated to the connolly meeting no further irs audits were undertaken that year and no criminal prosecution was ever brought for the possible corporate contribution first with respect to the irs the deductions in question were disallowed reducing mpi's reported loss for the year nineteen sixty eight footnote when asked of the final result in the irs matter jacobson replied that quote, a pretty sizable deficiency unquote, was paid this of course is inaccurate End footnote. later in nineteen seventy two Responsibility for examining farmer cooperatives was transferred from exempt organization specialists to income tax agents. Accordingly, Bond's responsibility for MPI and AMPI was transferred to another IRS agent, who reviewed the returns for the subsequent years and determined that since AMPI had a loss carry forward of over $1 million for its tax period ending September 30, 1969 there was no quote, income tax potential end quote, to justify time consuming audits and no additional audits were undertaken at that time moreover it was generally assumed at that time that there were no additional corporate contributions by mpi or ampi since the co-op had formed a vehicle for making legal dairy contributions tape during the 1969 fiscal year the year immediately following the year that had already been audited it should be noted however that since the completion of the irs review in nineteen seventy two there have been disclosures of additional corporate contributions in the nineteen sixty eight to seventy two period and full irs audits of the returns for nineteen sixty nine forward have been undertaken in addition in nineteen seventy four ampi filed amended returns for those years in which the loss carry forward has been fully depleted in the nineteen seventy two return resulting in substantial taxable income to ampi including over two hundred sixty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy two alone second according to henry peterson assistant attorney general for the criminal division there was some question about the applicability of section 610 to the MPI expenditure, but nonetheless, the decision was made by the division in 1972 to investigate it further. Footnote. The book was distributed at the end of 1967, several months before President Johnson announced he was not seeking re-election. Section 610 prohibits a corporate contribution, quote, in connection with any election, political convention or caucus end quote. the question was raised by those at the department of justice as to the relationship if any between the mpi expenditure and the nineteen sixty eight campaign end footnote. however after some investigation by the fbi the justice department file was mistakenly returned to the inactive files of the department and not discovered until nineteen seventy four after the statute of limitations to the transaction in question had expired in any event peterson flatly denied any improper conduct by his division in connection with the investigation footnote peterson and former attorney general kleindienst did acknowledge in staff interview that there were several inquiries in nineteen seventy two made by connolly for jacobson but with respect to another matter a pending criminal division investigation of Jacobson's involvement in a possible savings and loan fraud in Texas. Kleindienst remembers being contacted by Connolly and passing on the inquiry to Peterson. Peterson recalls four inquiries in all, two from then Attorney General Mitchell and then two more from Kleindienst. The first after Connolly had called Kleindienst and the second after a call from the White House to Kleindienst. Peterson says he was upset over the number, although not the content, of these calls. In any event, although it appears that Connolly made these calls on behalf of Jacobson, Peterson says there was no reference to the AMPI IRS matter by Connolly. End footnote.
End of section 35. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 36 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. E. April 4, 1972. An Aborted Contribution and the Antitrust Suit. George Merrin, AMPI's general manager, has stated publicly a number of times that he rejected a request from Kalmbach that AMPI make a further contribution to the president's campaign, and that his refusal helped precipitate the Justice Department's decision to file the antitrust suit. None of the evidence uncovered by the committee or apparently by the special prosecutor supports that contention. Footnote. The suggestion that political contributions in any way influenced the Justice Department's decision to file the civil antitrust suit against AMPI is not supported by any documents in the possession of the Justice Department or the special prosecutor. John Sale, assistant special prosecutor, Watergate Special Prosecution Force, has filed an affidavit in the antitrust suit in response to a motion by defendants for production of documents. Sales' affidavit states the following. I am familiar with all the documents and recordings in the possession of the Watergate Special Prosecution Force relating to political contributions from milk cooperatives. None of these documents or recordings support AMPI's allegations that United States v. AMPI was filed for the purpose of inducing representatives of AMPI to cause the trust for agricultural political education, TAPE, to make campaign contributions directly or indirectly to individuals or organizations involved in the raising of funds for the re-election of President Nixon. End footnote. In fact, as explained above, the evidence tends to show that the Attorney General made several decisions favorable to the dairymen after he had become fully aware of AMPI's past and promised support for the campaign effort, and after he had consulted with Haldeman and perhaps others on the possible impact of an unfavorable decision on further contributions. Marin did not even meet with Kalmbach until after the suit was filed, and it was not until the day the suit was filed that Haldeman was informed that the dairymen were not going to contribute the full two million dollars. What's more, there is evidence that AMPI not only tried to use its political influence to delay the filing of the suit, but that, after it was filed, Marin offered to make a substantial contribution in exchange for assistance from the White House on the suit. 1. Pre-April 4 Discussions After the antitrust suit was filed, AMPI representatives such as Merrin and Murray Chotner expressed their unhappiness over the suit to a number of administration representatives, including Mitchell, and, as noted above, Kalmbach and Secretary Connolly. At the same time, discussions about additional contributions continued. A. Kalmbach Jacobson and Merrin. At the February 3 meeting with Kalmbach, when the additional $750,000 contribution was discussed, Merrin apparently talked to Kalmbach about the antitrust suit, who, according to Jacobson, was, quote, sympathetic. Jacobson says that Merrin did not want to give to the president's campaign after the administration had filed suit against him, and that Merrin told that to Kalmbach. Footnote. Neither Merrin nor Kalmbach recall discussing the antitrust suit at the February 3 meeting, although Kalmbach did discuss the matter with Mitchell, with whom he was discussing his solicitations of the milk producers. End footnote. Nonetheless, there is evidence that Merrin felt that a contribution was wise or obligatory to fulfill prior commitments and in view of the antitrust suit. As noted above, 
he told isham early in 1972 that they were going to have to contribute and jacobson says Marin told him that he hoped the contribution would help alleviate the milk producers problem with the antitrust suit b chotiner and mitchell ampi did not limit itself to one line of contact with the administration about the antitrust suit in addition to jacobson contacting kalmbach marion harrison and murray chotiner were contacting the top officials at the justice department including attorney general mitchell in late january 1972 several weeks after Marin had replaced nelson harrison flew to san antonio and met with Marin in an attempt to solidify his firm's relationship and its one hundred eight thousand dollar per year retainer with the new management Marin says that harrison told him that he had played a major role in arranging for the dairy contributions the previous year although according to Marin, nelson and parr had expressed to Marin their opinion that harrison had been quote ineffective end quote with respect to those contributions in any event additional contributions were discussed and harrison gained the impression that Marin did not want to make any further contributions for the president's campaign at about the same time as the harrison Marin discussion of contributions stuart russell one of ampi's counsel who was engaged in pre-filing negotiations with the chicago office of the justice department contacted harrison and asked him to see if anything could be done before the suit was filed before harrison could act however the suit was filed harrison then talked to chotiner who was counsel to the harrison firm and who had also been involved in the dairy contribution and price support activities the previous year and the two agreed that since richard kleindienst had been nominated to replace mitchell who was leaving to head the president's campaign effort they should await kleindienst's confirmation and then speak to him about the suit the next night february twenty fourth nineteen seventy two chotiner met mitchell at a so-called agnew sinatra end quote, cocktail party and asked him about the suit according to chotiner mitchell merely puffed on his pipe mitchell says he attended the party but does not recall any discussion with chotiner footnote as noted above mitchell in a staff interview said that the only person other than kalmbach with whom he would have discussed the milk producers situation was chotiner End footnote. although chotiner's description of mitchell's response seems to indicate that the conversation was probably insignificant and definitely one-sided harrison thought the meeting was important enough to describe chotiner's account of it to george Marin in a letter dated the next day february twenty five nineteen seventy two the letter reads in view of the changing of the guard apart from jake's reasoning i decided with murray's concurrence not to talk with the incumbent but to take the matter up anew with his successor then murray ran into john at the agnew sinatra party they had a tete-a-tete -tete on another matter and this subject came up the version of the facts i surmised to you by telephone is confirmed i guessed right the confirmation vote will be no earlier than february twenty nine and probably later next week after that i'll go see the new management in a week or two i'll endeavor to zero in harrison explained that his quote version of the facts was that mclaren was responsible for filing the suit and that Mitchell had merely signed off on the suit and knew little about the circumstances of its subsequent filing. Harrison also says that his reference to, quote, Jake's reasoning, unquote, was to the fact that Jacobson felt nothing could be done about the suit. However, Jacobson testified that he does not know what was meant by, quote, Jake's reasoning, and that contrary to Harrison's view of his, quote, reasoning, he felt political contributions could help AMPI in all its problems, including the antitrust suit. Because of the ITT scandal, Kleindienst was not confirmed by the Senate until June 8, 1972, 
after which harrison was to quote zero in and see the new attorney general which he did apparently nothing came from that contact and at the end of june ampi fired the harrison firm because according to chotiner it did not get a good response for ampi from the administration two april four meeting and contacts with kalmbach about the antitrust suit and contributions despite Marin's alleged reluctance to contribute to the president's campaign and despite his conversations with kalmbach and connolly on march sixteen there is evidence that Marin made one last effort prior to april seven to make a substantial contribution in order to secure white house intervention in the antitrust suit according to lilly and nelson a meeting was held on april four in Marin's office to discuss the matter and as a result of the meeting checks for a one hundred fifty thousand dollar contribution to the president's campaign were drawn but later voided after kalmbach says he rejected Marin's offer of a quid pro quo involving the antitrust suit a the meeting present at the april four meeting were Marin, lilly nelson and perhaps for part of the meeting lynn elrod another ampi employee and assistant to Marin. lilly says that at the meeting it was decided that prior to april seven nelson was to deliver a total of three hundred thousand dollars from the three dairy trusts one hundred fifty thousand dollars from tape one hundred thousand dollars from adept and fifty thousand dollars from space before consenting to make a contribution Marin called john butterbrot ampi's president to obtain his approval as related by lilly Marin also wanted to talk to kalmbach so that he and all republicans would know that ampi was not welching on its commitment made the previous year in connection with the milk price support decision lilly added quote, further Marin stated he expected the justice department to slow down its antitrust suit against ampi and later reduce it to a wrist slap end quote. lilly says that Marin then called jacobson in austin and asked him to contact kalmbach to arrange for the contribution jacobson called Marin back and told him that kalmbach would call him that night in the meantime thirty checks each for five thousand dollars for a total of one hundred fifty thousand dollars were drawn but with the names of the payees left blank awaiting committee names from kalmbach that morning however robert isham the sole tape trustee had resigned to avoid having anything to do with the contemplated contribution as a result the checks were drawn on the account of ampi's new political arm ctape which was then being organized to replace tape and were signed by the two signatories on the recently opened c tape account Marin and elrod footnote at the time the checks were drawn there were insufficient funds in the c tape account to cover the checks however there were ample funds in the tape account and under the tape trust agreement the ampi board had the authority to appoint a new trustee who could either have written the checks on the tape account or have transferred the funds to the c tape account to cover the checks after they had been delivered but before they had been cashed by the president's campaign committees in fact at the april twelve to thirteen meeting of the ampi board Marin was appointed trustee for tape and throughout the remainder of nineteen seventy three tape transferred over one million dollars to the c tape account End footnote. lilly says that since only twenty six checks were in the c tape checkbook in san antonio he had to contact jacobson in austin to have four blank checks delivered that day from the citizens national bank of which jacobson was chairman late in the afternoon at four or four thirty john parker an officer at the bank called lilly and told him that another bank employee don wallace would deliver the extra four checks at about six p m wallace arrived at ampi and de delivered the checks which were completed by an ampi secretary verna polk 
it then appears that elrod signed the four checks and took them to merrin's home that evening for his signature before merrin left san antonio early the next morning for an ampi meeting in fond du lac wisconsin the thirty checks were voided within a day or two by elrod at merrin's direction and never delivered although merrin and elrod readily concede that fact both claim they have no recollection of why they were drawn in the first place or later voided however by kalmbach's and lily's accounts merrin did speak that evening to kalmbach who rejected merrin's offer of a quid pro quo b kalmbach's call to merrin kalmbach says that on or about april four jacobson talked to him by telephone and asked him to call merrin when kalmbach made the call the same evening kalmbach says that merrin told him that he was ready to make a substantial contribution but that he had wanted to talk to kalmbach before doing so merrin expressed concern over the antitrust suit and asked him to speak to someone at the white house on ampi's behalf kalmbach understood the message the contribution was to be made in order to have Kalmbach contact the White House for help on the antitrust suit. Kalmbach says he rejected Merrin's offer and request. At that point, according to Kalmbach, Merrin appeared particularly frustrated and said something to the effect that, quote, here you're asking for contributions and you're not willing to help, end quote. The conversation then ended rather abruptly. Kalmbach says he reported to Ehrlichman that he had broken off contact with, quote, the milk people because they were seeking a quid pro quo, and that Ehrlichman had told him, quote, that's good judgment, end quote. Footnote. Kalmbach is not sure whether he reported this to Ehrlichman after his March 16 meeting or April 4 conversation with Merrin. If it was between March 16 and April 4, Kalmbach says that he anticipated that AMPI would request a quid pro quo, which he says Merrin did on April 4. End footnote. Although he thought it had occurred before 1972, Ehrlichman did recall such a conversation with Kalmbach. C. Corroboration of Lilly's Account On November 16, 1973, Lilly testified in executive session that Merrin had told him, shortly after April 4, 1972, that Kalmbach had called him and refused the contributions, just as Kalmbach testified before the committee four months later in March 1974. As in the case of several other incidents investigated by the committee, Lilly's account of the meeting and of the call from Kalmbach on April 4 have been corroborated by independent evidence most of which was unknown and unavailable to Lilly at the time he testified. This corroboration includes the following. Merrin's Logs Merrin's logs indicate that a meeting was scheduled and held in his office on April 4 involving himself, Nelson, Lilly, and possibly Elrod. Merrin concedes that the meeting took place, but says he cannot recall the subject of the meeting. Butterbrot's Telephone Records Lilly testified that Merrin conferred with Butterbrot on the $150,000 tape C-tape contribution. Butterbrot confirms that after the February 3 meeting with Kalmbach, Merrin told him that money could be contributed secretly to the president's campaign prior to April 7 via state committees, but since they had agreed to reject that approach, Merrin did not discuss another contribution with him on April 4. However, Butterbrot's telephone records indicate that he called the San Antonio home office twice on the morning of the 4th, and he assumes that, as Lilly testified, he talked to Merrin at least one of those times. Nelson Testimony Like Lilly, Nelson has testified that he attended the meeting on April 4, and that Merrin did not want to contribute the $150,000 unless he was able to speak to Kalmbach to see if he could help them with the antitrust suit. Footnote. Nelson does not recall any discussion at the meeting of a total of an additional $150,000 from Adept and Space. End footnote. The Voided Checks 
the c tape records reflect thirty checks each for five thousand dollars drawn in blank signed by merrin and elrod and voided by elrod employees at the citizens national bank john parker and don wallace and at ampi verna polk and lynn elrod confirm lilly's account that four of the thirty checks were delivered to ampi from the austin bank late on the afternoon of the fourth and apparently rushed to merrin's home for him to sign them that evening Combox telephone logs the records of Kalmbach's telephone calls and the appropriate records of the San Antonio and Austin telephone companies reflect that on April 4, Kalmbach called both Jacobson and Merrin. Footnote. During 1972, Kalmbach charged some of his telephone calls concerning the campaign to an RNC credit card, and a committee search of the RNC records revealed for the first time to Watergate investigators that he charged calls to one number in San Antonio and one in Austin on the 4th. A committee check of the telephone records for the San Antonio and Austin telephone companies revealed that on April 4, 1972, those numbers were listed for George Merrin and Jake Jacobson, respectively. End footnote. Dwight Morris, Butterbroat Conversation The committee has uncovered further evidence to corroborate the account of Merrin's attempt to secure a quid pro quo. In response to a committee questionnaire to present and former AMPI directors and employees, former AMPI official Dwight Morris stated, and later testified before the committee, that John Butterbroat discussed the matter with him one week after it occurred. Morris had been secretary to the board of AMPI and vice president of the Southern Region and Arkansas Division of AMPI until February 1972, when he became active with some of Parr's former assistants in a rival dairy co-op group in Arkansas, the Southern Milk Producers Association. Morris says that AMPI was attempting to squelch the revolt and absorb the rival group and that Butterbrot met with him in Chicago on April 11, 1972, to try to work out their differences. In the midst of the conversation, Butterbrot referred to the antitrust suit and told Morris of AMPI's efforts to handle it. Butterbrot allegedly told Morris that AMPI representatives had gone to Washington to see what could be done about the suit and spent a couple of days speaking to people at the Justice Department and elsewhere, but no one would enter into a, quote, meaningful conversation with them. Footnote. Morris said that he thinks Butterbrot told him that Merrin, he and perhaps Nelson, had gone to Washington and then met with Kalmbach, but he may just have assumed that Butterbrot personally was involved, and that Butterbrot's reference to we may have been merely a reference to AMPI's representatives other than himself. There is no evidence that Butterbrot personally participated in conversations with Kalmbach. End footnote. Morris testified that Butterbrot told him, Finally, after making the rounds, someone suggested that the real way to solve their problem would be to talk to Mr. Kalmbach. They met with Mr. Kalmbach and came to an agreement that AMPI would pay $300,000 to Kalmbach, and that as a result of that, the antitrust suit against AMPI would go away. The AMPI representatives came back home with the understanding that Mr. Kalmbach would direct them where or to whom to send the money, and before that could be accomplished, the ITT thing hit the press, and Mr. Kalmbach sent word to AMPI that he did not want their money. Although Butterbrot does not recall telling these details to Morris, he concedes that he may have discussed contributions with Morris at their meeting. Furthermore, he says that he knew that Merrin and others had met with Kalmbach and Connolly, and that they had discussed pre-April 7 contributions with Kalmbach. There is evidence, then, that AMPI's top officials sought, through Kalmbach, high-level White House assistance on the antitrust suit in exchange for a substantial and secret pre-April 7 contribution.
this time kalmbach after nearly three years of hearing of milk producer pledges and contributions linked to favorable decisions by the administration backed away at the time of the itt scandal and in view of the damaging publicity in connection with the previous year's dairy contributions and price support activities kalmbach decided to try and prevent another milk producer scandal as a result no further dairyman contributions were made to the president's campaign for several months and there is no evidence that kalmbach or any white house official intervened in the antitrust suit thereafter footnote in fact there is evidence that later in nineteen seventy two at least one white house official viewed the progress of the antitrust suit as a quote positive offset to adverse publicity over the quote milk deal the year before end footnote end section thirty six recording by linda johnson section thirty seven of the watergate report volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano final report of the senate select committee on presidential campaign activities volume two chapter five milk fund part twenty one milk producer contributions to the president's campaign after april seven nineteen seventy two for the duration of nineteen seventy two the milk producers reportedly contributed another ninety five thousand dollars to the president's campaign primarily due to the solicitation efforts of lee nunn and clayton yoiter of fcrp and jacobson and connolly on behalf of democrats for nixon in addition just prior to the election lee nunn of fcrp solicited from ctape a presidential contribution of as much as six hundred and fifty thousand dollars or seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars allegedly in satisfaction of the earlier dairy commitment dating back at least to march nineteen seventy one in late october nineteen seventy two c t a p e contributed approximately three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to republican congressional committees and about the same time these committees transferred about two hundred thousand dollars to the rnc and then to the fcrp while there had been transfers totaling six hundred and fifty thousand dollars from rnc committees to the congressional committees some weeks before and there is some evidence that the two hundred thousand dollars was in repayment of those earlier transfers a number of the rnc senatorial and congressional committee officials involved were not aware of any relation between the transactions there is also other evidence that the movement of the dairy money to fcrp was part of a plan arranged by nunn and possibly stands to divert the ctape congressional contributions to the president's campaign there is no evidence that any other officials connected with the congressional senatorial or republican national committees knew the circumstances of the solicitation of the CTAPE contribution, or considered the contribution related to any dairy commitment to the President's campaign, or to governmental action favorable to the dairy industry. A significant result of the manner in which these dairy trust contributions were made, particularly those to FCRP, made after the last pre-election reporting date, and the CTAPE contributions routed through the congressional committees was that an additional link between dairymen and the president's campaign was kept from public view prior to the election a ninety five thousand dollars from adept and space 
Late in the summer of 1972, leaders of both D.I. and Mid-Am met with Connolly, then head of Democrats for Nixon, and apparently discussed some of their problems with the administration and committed $50,000 to his organization, which was contributed almost immediately thereafter. Meanwhile, FCRP officials Lee Nunn and Clayton Yoiter, who had taken over certain of Kalmbach's solicitation responsibilities, were arranging for another $45,000 to be contributed by the dairy trusts of the two co-ops just prior to November 7th, after the final pre-election reporting period had ended. 1. Meeting with Connolly and $50,000 for Democrats for Nixon In an August 7, 1972, CRP memo, there appears a list of the subgroups of the agribusiness industry covered by the President's campaign fundraising effort, with the following notation, quote, Milk Producers, Lee Nunn and John Connolly Handling, end quote. Five days earlier, Connolly, who headed Democrats for Nixon, had met with a number of dairy co-op officials. Connolly's log for August 2, 1972, lists a meeting with Morgan and Westwater of D.I., Gene Baldy, general manager of Mid-Am, Hanman, also of Mid-Am, and Marin of A.M.P.I. Marin did not attend, but Parr, by that time employed by D.I., did. One of the principal outcomes of the meeting was the making of additional milk producer contributions to Democrats for Nixon. Jacobson, who was assisting Connolly in the Democrats for Nixon organization, says that the Mid-Am and D.I. officials contacted him and said that they wanted to make a contribution to Democrats for Nixon and to FCRP, but they wanted to talk to Connolly first. Jacobson informed Lee Nunn of FCRP and arranged the meeting with Connolly, as he had done on a number of occasions earlier in the year, in connection with fundraising meetings between the milk producers and Kalmbach. Officials of the two co-ops had discussed the matter of contributions to Democrats for Nixon and came to Washington to meet Connolly and ready to announce their commitment of $25,000 each. Footnote. C. Hanman, 14 Hearings, 5892-5893 and 5895. End of footnote. In fact, Westwater says that he brought the $25,000 space check with him to Washington. At the meeting, the dairy officials told Connolly of what they considered the negative attitude of the administration toward dairy co-ops on a number of matters, including possible antitrust violations. They say they also discussed contributions to the president's campaign. Hanman says that although he had not intended to announce a commitment for a contribution, he and the DI representatives did so at Connolly's request. Mr. Hanman, I think Mr. Connolly asked us if we were going to make a commitment, a contribution. He indicated that he was going to have a party in Texas somewhere where the president would be there. He would like for some of us people to be there. Senator Montoya, with the money? Mr. Hanman, no, he was inviting only those people, I think, who were going to make some contributions. And as I recall as the way the meeting developed, that's how we got to the $25,000. It was an opportunity to get to this dinner and meet the president and meet some of his supporters. And I believe that's about the way it developed. In direct contradiction to Hanman's sworn testimony, Connolly testified that although there may have been a passing reference to milk producers' support, quote, the meeting in no way on August 2nd was a meeting that dealt with political contributions, end quote. Mr. Weitz, you are certain of that. Mr. Connolly, I am certain of that. Connolly testified that, in fact, he did not even know of the two $25,000 contributions. However, aside from the testimony of Hanman, the records of space, DI's trust, indicate that it contributed $25,000 to the National Democrats for Nixon on or shortly after August 2nd. 
the day of the Connolly meeting. In fact, Westwater says Connolly personally accepted the $25,000 space check sometime shortly after the meeting. Despite Connolly's testimony before the committee that at about the same time he refused to use the $10,000 cash for Democrats for Nixon, which Lilly of AMPI had in 1971 given to Jacobson for Connolly's designation for political campaigns. On September 19, ADEPT, Mid-Am's Trust, contributed 25000 6000 to the national organization and 19000 to four state Democrats for Nixon committees. Connolly testified that he was told only of the contributions to the national organizations, $25,000 from SPACE and $6,000 from ADEPT. However, Hahnemann testified that at the August 2nd meeting, Connolly solicited and Hahnemann committed $25,000 from ADEPT, in addition to the $25,000 space commitment, and Jacobson has testified that he thinks he informed Connolly of both $25,000 contributions when they were made. Footnote Hahnemann, 14, Hearings, 5893, Jacobson, 15, Hearings, 6475. Connolly also denied tying invitations to a September reception at his ranch he was planning for the president to additional contributions. Quote, no invitation to that meeting was tied to a contribution of one thin dime. End quote. To the contrary, Hahnemann testified that Connolly raised the subject of the reception in connection with contributions, and the dairy officials responded with their commitments. Moreover, the space and adept contributions were completed by September 19, and representatives of both co-ops attended the reception several days later. Footnote. Hahnemann, 14, Hearings, 5893, 5896-97. The reception was held on September 22, 1972. End of footnote. 2. $45,000 to FCRP. On May 1, 1972, Jacobson and two DI officials, Ben Morgan, who had replaced Paul Alasia the previous year as executive director, and Joseph Westwater, flew to California and met with Kalmbach. Footnote. Those attending the meeting agree it took place in the spring or early summer of 1972. Westwater says in a staff interview that it was in May, and Kalmbach's logs, in the committee's possession, indicate that the only meeting with Jacobson that month was on May 1st. End of footnote. Jacobson says that Morgan and Westwater had told him that they wanted to make a contribution to the president's campaign, and he made an appointment for them with Kalmbach. While it is not clear whether political contributions were discussed at the meeting with Kalmbach, it appears that no effort was made to collect any further contributions to FCRP from ADEPT or SPACE until several months later, when Clayton Yoiter, a former USD official and a CRP official responsible for farm interest groups, became involved in fundraising. In late summer 1972, Yoiter contacted Westwater of DI and Gary Hahnemann of Mid-Am to solicit contributions and each co-op's trust made a contribution just prior to the election. On October 28, SPACE contributed $25,000 to FCRP, and on November 6, the day before the election, ADEP contributed $4,000 to each of five state FCRP committees for a total of $20,000. Footnote. See Kima Affidavit Supra. The $25,000 from SPACE may have been used to pay for CRP campaign leaflets. In a September 6, 1972 memo from Yoiter to campaign official Fred Malik, Yoiter referred to the printing and distribution of 500,000 copies each of two agricultural campaign leaflets. Quote, President Nixon, the right choice for America's farmers. End quote. And, quote, nobody bullies butts. End quote costing approximately $15,000 to be paid by D.I., quote, one of the dairy cooperatives that has been most friendly to the administration, end quote, 
Deuter Memo, 17 Hearings, 8167. According to the memo, Stan suggested that the November Group, a public relations organization for the President's campaign, contract with the printer, and that DI paid the printer directly for the pamphlets which it would then deliver to CRP as a campaign contribution in kind. Westwater says that although he did discuss the printing and the contribution with Yoiter, and he later received copies of the pamphlets from Yoiter before they were distributed, he does not remember whether the contribution was to pay for the pamphlets. However, a search of the DI and space files has revealed no direct expenditure to the printer. End of footnote. Because of the timing of the contributions, they were not publicly reported until well after the election. According to federal election laws, final pre-election reports must be filed by political committees five days before the election covering contributions made up to 12 days before the election. And in the case of the 1972 presidential election, October 26, 1972, Westwater said in a staff interview that although Yoiter met with him well in advance of October 28 to discuss the contribution, Westwater delayed delivery of the check until October 28, and this may have been at Yoiter's suggestion. Westwater says he may also have discussed the matter with Gary Hahnman of Mid Am and Marion Harrison, whose firm had been retained by Mid-Am and D.I. B. $200,000 to the President's Campaign AMPI's trust CTAPE was also solicited for a last-minute pre-election contribution with the ultimate result that $200,000 of CTAPE money was furnished to the President's Campaign. After the ITT scandal and the Watergate break-in, there was increased concern among White House officials about damaging disclosures in connection with the milk case. On August 31, 1972, for example, in a memorandum to Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Colson, Clark McGregor, Stans, and Whitaker on the progress of the Nader milk suit, Dean noted that as a result of possible depositions of ex-Secretary Hardin, Chotner, Colson, Whitaker, and others, and attempts to obtain internal White House papers, quote, the potential for political embarrassment during the remaining months of the campaign is high. End quote. Footnote. Strachan Exhibit 14, 16 Hearings, 7511. In a staff interview, David Wilson, former staff assistant to the President, and aide to Dean, said that he had reviewed some White House milk documents for Dean to determine the extent the claim of executive privilege would be asserted although Wilson says he saw only one reference to the documents to political contributions, the March 22, 1971 memo from Whitaker to the President, described in Section 1 v f 3 above, he did not have access to Colson's file. As noted above, Dean, who did, apparently considered the materials damaging. End of footnote. Dean also noted, quote, on the positive side, end quote, from the White House point of view, that the Justice Department antitrust suit was proceeding quickly, and that, quote, this vigorous prosecution shall call into question any allegations by Nader that the milk producers have influenced the administration by their political contributions. End quote. Footnote. Strachan, Exhibit 14, 16, Hearings, 7512. Dean reported that the suit might be ready for trial by the spring of 1973. In mid-1974, pre-trial discovery proceedings were still underway, apparently not because of any less vigorous prosecution, but because of two independent factors. 1. Since issues were raised in the suit of the impact of AMPI political activities on the suit itself and other governmental matters involving AMPI, pre-trial discovery became concerned with AMPI's political activities. 2. There are allegations, some of which have been substantiated in committee testimony and staff interviews, that AMPI employees willfully destroyed company documents in the spring of 1971, and possibly early 1972, to hide certain damaging evidence from government and other investigators. 
c par fifteen hearings six eight nine three six eight nine four through nine six murphy interview december eleventh nineteen seventy three end of footnote despite concerns at the white house over presidential links to the milk producers another contribution from ampi's political committee to the president's campaign was solicited from george mayron ampi's general manager by lee nunn vice chairman of the finance committee to re-elect the president just prior to the election to fulfill the previous commitment made in connection with the nineteen seventy one milk price support decision according to accounts of a number of the participants in the events including bob lilly who as secretary for ctape was briefed by Marin in late october nineteen seventy two and made contemporaneous notes none asked Marin for the balance of the commitment from ampi that dated back to nineteen seventy and nineteen seventy one to help meet the commitment Marin agreed for ctape to contribute three hundred thousand dollars to congressional committees which according to lilly was to go primarily for the president's re-election effort one nunn Marin meeting lee nunn had been involved in arranging for the milk producer contributions in nineteen seventy one and according to the august seventh nineteen seventy two c r p memo noted above he and connolly were handling the milk producers in early august connolly had met with mid am and d i officials and obtained fifty thousand dollars in contributions from them nunn apparently focused his attention on ampi which as he stated quote, sort of control that what the others did End quote. nunn says that after the republican national convention stans pressed his presidential campaign fundraisers to solicit more money to offset what stans considered a likely campaign debt of as much as ten million dollars nunn offered to solicit a contribution for ampi and he thereupon contacted marion harrison who referred him to jacobson who in turn put him in touch with Marin. this contact with Marin appears to have been part of the coordinated effort of fcrp and democrats for nixon to solicit the three major dairy co-ops for more money just prior to the election Marin says that during the week of october seventeen jacobson called him and arranged a meeting between him and nunn who Marin believes jacobson described as Kalmbach's replacement as the chief republican fundraiser footnote Marin, sixteen hearings seven two eight 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 nine jacobson conceded that he talked to nunn but denied calling Marin. jacobson fifteen hearings six four seven seven end of footnote on saturday morning october twenty one nunn flew to san antonio and met Marin in his office nunn opened the meeting by explaining that he had replaced combat at f c r p and by stating that the projected presidential campaign debt was ten million dollars due in large part to the media expenses at the c r p media arm the november group footnote nunn seventeen hearings seven five five six to five seven Marin sixteen hearings seven two nine four seven two nine six Marin says nunn told him they were already three and a half million dollars in debt and would reach a ten million dollar debt by the end of the campaign Marin, sixteen hearings seven two nine six the campaign ended with a several million dollar surplus end of footnote although nunn does not recall requesting a specific amount from ampi Marin said nunn asked for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars Marin says that nunn attached to his request the following statements quote, well it never could be quid pro quo it never would be it is correct that the president does remember his friends who helped him end quote. according to Marin, quote, that is as close to a quid pro quo statement as i think anybody ever came to me end quote. Marin says he told nunn that while the committee for tape had voted not to make any additional presidential contributions but only congressional contributions he would relay nunn's request to the committee members and advise nunn of their decision nunn says that in view of ampi's reluctance to contribute to the president's campaign he made a pitch to Marin for contributions to republican congressional candidates apparently deciding not to make a direct appeal to the ctape members to reverse the earlier vote 
none suggested several candidates who particularly needed funds for the remaining days of their campaigns but Marin was antagonistic to some of them none is not certain whether it was at this point or later that Marin none the less told him that he would recommend that ctap contribute one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each to the republican senatorial and congressional campaign committees for the use of whatever republican candidates the committees selected presumably including those candidates whom Marin opposed but before the contributions were made Marin conferred first with former president johnson then his fellow ctap officials including bob lilly two l b j Marin meeting Marin held several high posts in president johnson's administration including that of, of assistant secretary of agriculture although Marin did not do so often he says he decided to meet with the former president because he began to wonder whether his refusal to contribute to president nixon's campaign would jeopardize the co-op immediately after nunn left Marin flew to the lpj ranch and met with president johnson on the afternoon of the twenty first pursuant to an appointment he had made immediately after jacobson had set up his meeting with nunn earlier in the week Marin says he described to president johnson his meeting with nunn including nunn's reference to a large campaign debt to which he responded incredulously quote, do you really believe that End quote. Marin answered quote, you didn't ask me what i believed you asked me what mr nunn had said End quote. Marin concedes that despite his claim that he knew of no prior commitments they discussed the very subject of dairy co-op commitments to president nixon's campaign Marin says that when he raised the subject with Johnson, the latter's advice was that, quote, if there be a commitment, he considered it our obligation, not mine personally, the TAPE obligation, and we should meet it. End quote. Marin attempted to explain how he came to discuss with President Johnson the subject of supposedly non existent commitments. I had begun to see a sequence of Jacobson, Jacobson, and on the peripheral basis, at least nelson i kept saying to myself why 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 after the combat matters why would jacobson be so persistent in this for some reason or other these people found it necessary to try to get dairy money into the republican campaign as a result of their meeting Marin says that he at president johnson's suggestion agreed that ctap should make additional congressional contributions and that the trust should balance its total contributions for the year to both parties Marin says that the former president also noted that these congressional contributions could benefit the presidential campaigns without further linking ctap to the presidential campaign by being used to pay for the expenses of campaign events attended by both congressional and presidential candidates Marin says that subsequently he conferred with his CTAP officials and obtained their approval for that approach. One of those with whom Marin conferred was Lilly, secretary of CTAP, who testified to one significant additional detail, that the plan also included the diversion of some of the milk contributions from the congressional races directly to the president's campaign effort. Because of that, Lilly says that he objected his account of the Marin meetings varies in some important respects from Marin's and Nunn's. 3. Lily Marin Meeting On October 23rd, two days after his meeting with Nunn and the former president, Marin met with Bob Lilly and related to him the substance of the two meetings. According to Lilly's contemporaneous notes, there were several key items omitted by Marin and Nunn in their testimony, which indicate that the contributions solicited and finally made were expressly for the president's campaign in satisfaction of the prior commitment made for the 1971 price support increase as testified to by lilly before the select committee on november 16 1973 nunn asked Marin to contribute seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the quote, obligation for the blank 1971 price support end quote decision and he suggested several alternatives seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to democrats for nixon or the committee to re-elect the president or three hundred twenty five thousand dollars each to the republican congressional and the republican senatorial campaign committees 
to Marin's account of his meeting with President Johnson, Lilly added the significant element that Marin told him he had gone to see Johnson, quote, to discuss the commitment of $750,000 to the Republican Party from a carryover from 1971, end quote, and that it was in that context that the former president responded, quote, if you made the commitment, well then fulfill it and carry it out, regardless of how hard that might hurt. End quote. On the question of commitments, Lilly stated he was told by Marin that President Johnson discussed a $250,000 milk producer commitment to him, presumably in the 1964 campaign, which he wanted fulfilled. President Johnson allegedly indicated a detailed knowledge of the AMPI producer's checkoff system and told Marin the commitment could be met by means of deductions from the producer's checks. Marin acknowledged that President Johnson discussed the earlier commitment, but denied that the former president either considered it an outstanding obligation or mentioned any system of raising monies by a checkoff of dairy producers to meet that prior commitment. Although Lilly testified that he could not explain the discrepancy between the $750,000 none allegedly requested for Democrats for Nixon, or FCRP, versus the total of $650,000 none requested for the congressional committees other evidence in the committee's possession supports the conclusion that the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and six hundred fifty thousand dollar figures were both related to the prior commitment for the nineteen seventy one milk decision it should be recalled that in february nineteen seventy two straken reported to haldeman that combat was making arrangements for the milk producers to contribute the remaining seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to reach the modified commitment of one million dollars due to the itt scandal further contributions were delayed until just prior to the election by the time of the nun marin meeting an additional fifty thousand dollars had recently come in from the trusts of the other two co-ops adept and space to democrats for nixon and a like amount was expected from them for fcrp footnote Another $45,000 was contributed by Space and ADEPT to FCRP within the next two weeks. See sections VIIA Supra. End of footnote. Thus, consistent with Lilly's notes, $650,000 of the $750,000 commitment was still needed to enable the milk producers to meet their obligation, which had originated a year earlier in connection with the 1971 milk price support decision. Instead of the $650,000, a total of $300,000 was contributed, the same amount that, according to Lilly, was proposed by AMPI for the President's campaign as prior to April 7, 1972, in connection with the antitrust suit. The public records of CTAPE show, it going to Republican congressional committees, there is evidence that, in fact, an FCRP official diverted most of that money through the committees onto the Finance Committee to re-elect the President. End of Section 37 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida